Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm continuing my discussion on the mainstream media discourse on rapid climate change. About a month and a half ago, almost two months ago, there was a report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC SR 1.5, which talked basically about the risks of climate change, how bad it was, how bad it is, and it came much more closer to the reality of climate. Although there were a number of things that I criticized at the time when it came out, like the baseline shifting, for example, of temperature, and also the, um, the it didn't cover um, it didn't assess and cover the risks of, of uh, huge tipping points in the climate system that could very rapidly take us much, much higher than 1.5, you know, blow us through 1.52 and take us up very, very quickly. Um, you know, things like complete loss of Arctic sea ice, things like methane, methane emissions in the Arctic, etc. So it really downplayed those and also the... Um, the Complete, um, I got a cat for, if you, the last video, Shackleton was, uh, I had Shackleton and uh, I guess I inhaled some of his fur. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, so since then, there's been the National Climate Assessment Report. There's been, you know, recently, there's been just even more recently, a Lancet report on climate you know, how climate, how rapid climate change is affecting human health right now. I mean, all of these reports, instead of projecting out so much to the future, they're talking about these real dire and grave risks that are affecting us right now, okay? Um, so it seems that there is a turning of it. And, you know, how do I feel about this? Um, you know, on the one hand, you know, I'm very, very happy that finally mainstream media and mainstream scientists are getting more vocal and more concerned and raising awareness to more and more people. Um, it's still nowhere near enough, but at least it's happening. We're getting, you know, I've talked about the idea of having a tipping point in human understanding on the climate issue, and we haven't reached that probably far from it, but at least there's movement in that direction. Um, so, you know, and I, I've been talking about, you know, a climate emergency. We're in a cli global climate emergency. I've been talking about this for a long time now. So the fact that the mainstream is heading closer and closer towards this, you know, is a positive thing. Um, but it's also, you know, I was kind of hoping I was wrong. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's mixed, a mixed bag of, of feelings. Um, I was hoping there was some stuff that was missing and maybe climate wasn't as bad as uh, as I thought. Okay, but um, that's not turning out to, to be the case. So let me get back to where I was from the last video. Okay, so I was talking about the CO2 level and methane level and nitrous oxide level in the atmosphere, how they're continuing to rapidly increase. Now, another report that came out um, just a few days ago was the emissions gap report. This is a UN report talking about the gap in emissions. Basically, how much do we have to reduce emissions to have any hope to keep global temperatures well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels or even 1.5 degrees? Okay, so even these assessments, so if, I, if you, I clicked on the executive summary English, and I have this document here, and I'll just talk about some of the key, uh, key highlights in this. Okay, uh, where's my page down, page down. Okay, so the executive summary. Basically, let's have a look at this. So they say it's technically possible to bridge the gap to ensure global warming stays well below 2 degrees and 1.5, um, which I disagree with. But if these nationally determined con contributions, um, which are, you know, it's IPCC 
jargon. Um, nationally determined con um, concentrations, rather. If they're not increased, then there's no possible way we can um, maintain the 1.5 degree goal. That's what they're saying. Um, let me go to a plot in here, which is, is rather useful. Okay, uh, sorry, page down, page down, page down, page down. Here we go. Okay, so this is 2015 to 2030. This is no policy baseline of gigatons of CO2 equivalent globally being emitted. Okay, so, and this is the current policy scenario here. Okay, and then these are some of these scenarios, the nationally determined contributions. Um, don't worry about the different conditional to unconditional. Okay, so this is sort of what is being said is the guard band is we, we, we have 15 gigatons. We have to increase the emission reductions by 13 to 15 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent in order to have any chance to reach the two degree Celsius range. We have to do this by 2030. And in order to stay below the 1.5 degrees, we have to, the number is more like 30, 29 to 32 here. Now, where we are, we're, we're the, the contributions from Paris, etc., are way above any of these things. In fact, that's more like, that number is more like six. We've reduced it to six. So in other words, um, actually a bit less than six. So in other, the bottom line is that we have to triple the emission reductions in order to have any chance of staying below the two degrees Celsius. And we have to, we have to have five times more emission reductions than our on present policies on the table in order to have any chance at 1.5. So according, by any gambler's stretch of the imagination, this is an extreme long shot. It's turning out to be extremely difficult to reduce CO2 just based on emissions reductions. This makes it absolutely vital that we research and deploy as soon as humanly possible carbon dioxide removal methods. Now, that could be as simple as not cutting down forests, stimulating the oceans to get phytoplankton blooms. Um, there, there's all kinds of you know, direct air capture, if it's scalable, um, use, capturing CO2 out of the air and using it in the limestone in concrete. There's all kinds of different things being looked at, but we don't have anywhere near the resources or money going into these ideas, and these will become absolutely paramount. So we need to declare a global climate change emergency. We need to study as quickly as possible and deploy ways to remove CO2 from the atmosphere while we're doing these other things, not just CO2, but also methane and nitrous oxide. And we need solar radiation management techniques because we lose the Arctic sea ice, everything is going to greatly accelerate. Now, in the US, the fourth national climate assessment was just released recently. And this talks about all of the effects on the uh, US, okay, on you know the different impacts. And this is definitely worth a separate video. Okay, so, but you can have a look, you can find it in the link to the original Forbes article or just Google Fourth National Climate Assessment. Okay, in the Lancet now, okay, the Lancet report just came out, okay, on the health impacts, climate change and health impacts shaping the health of nations for centuries to come. And again, um, that's well worth a separate video. Okay, um, the UK Parliament um, very, very recently have, has, was discussing a new, there was an eight month inquiry, and then there were some new documents 
on the changing Arctic, for example. Okay, um, plastics in the Arctic, the Arctic feedbacks, the timelines, etc. You know, the Arctic is changing. I mean, this is the chair of the Environmental Audit Committee is saying the Arctic's changing rapidly, warming twice as fast. It's actually more like three times as fast as the rest of the planet. This brings potentially catastrophic consequences for the global climate, as well as commercial opportunities and risks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, it talks a bit about some of the changes in the Arctic. So the language in these documents, the key point I want to make in this video is that the language in this, these documents, these government documents, these mainstream media documents is getting more and more dire. This is the um, report, the global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, the IPCC report from um, yeah, a month and a half ago. So this is kind of the trigger, you know, it kicked off all of these other um, mainstream media you know, recognition of the problem, et cetera. So this is a technical summary, probably also um, good for an entirely separate video. Now, you're wondering, okay, what do we do about all this? I mean, we're, we're obviously in a very grave situation as far as climate goes. So this is a Wired article. The climate apocalypse is now, and it's happening to you. So... They did a survey here. Well, they didn't do a survey. They reported on a survey. They were talking about the cl climate change is a roller coaster of human ignorance. Wait, everybody knows that. Have you ever talked to people and said, you know, talk, told them how bad climate is? And they say, well, I mean, my mother says this. You know, my mother-in-law says this. They say, well, we, we all know that. We know that, right? Well, wait a minute. People do not have any idea on how bad climate change is, and they don't really, a lot of people just don't want to know, um, and they say, well, we know that, we know it's bad, but, you know, I'm not going to think about it because I can't do much about it. So Yale does a lot of these climate surveys, okay, and recently, you know, it's U.S. surveys, 74% of women and 70% of men believe climate change will harm future generations of humans. But of those numbers, only 48% of women, 42% of males, respectively, think that it's harming them personally. So those numbers are getting higher. But, you know, more and more people around the globe are being affected personally, directly, by climate change. So here's uh, something here. Now, this talks a bit about, the, this is from the Lancet Report. Okay, 157 million more people experienced a heat wave in 2016 than in 2000. That's around the globe, 12.3 million Americans. The heat and the injuries that could come from the cost, that basically come from the cost of this, okay, around the world, 153 billion hours of labor around the world, 1.1 billion in the U.S., okay? I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg, you know, um, it, you know, the longer we leave it, the more, the longer it takes before we declare a global climate change emergency and take emergency action, the less our resilience will be to deal with it at all. Okay, uh, global crop yield is going down. This is in the Lancet, and I'll talk about this separately, hopefully. The geographic range of mosquitoes carrying fevers is spreading. The range of bacteria that causes cholera is spreading. Global crop, crop yields are going down. Okay, and then they talk about, um, okay, so it talks about, so all of these reports, they're talking about how climate change is affecting people now, today. Forget about 2100. Forget about your grandkids. Okay, today, every day, climate change is affecting people around the world. Okay, I've talked about it as a climate casino. You know, one city gets hit by torrential rains, is flooded out. You know, luck of the draw a bit. You know, it's on a coastline and, uh, you know, a hurricane comes ashore and just stalls and stuff. So it's not just complete luck of the draw. It's on a coastline. You know, there's geographic factors that make cities more vulnerable than other cities. You know, even oil companies understand that burning fossil